Hi everyone, welcome back to World Class Inventors. This is video number 25 in the series. And today we're gonna start a new chapter. We're gonna take a deep dive and we're gonna be discussing patents. Now, I know we just finished up a series on provisional patents and we went through the rudimentary aspects on how to become a registered filer with the PTO, how to file a specification, and how to be an electronic user on the PTO website. And I actually showed you what it was like to draw up your own specification. That was only the beginning stage of this process. We are gonna get into patents for real, and I'm going to share with you what I've experienced and what I know about the process. Now, it's certainly not the definitive explanation of what the process is, but I would heavily invite you to read in the description below this video on what my background is, what I've done, what I've been through. You see, the invention help service sites out there, attorneys that you might speak with, the PTO itself representing itself, whether you call the electronic business unit or the help desk, or read some of their statements on their huge voluminous site they're gonna paint one type of a picture for you about patents. And they are not even gonna come close to talking about what I've been through with patents. Now, patents aren't bad. They're not good either. They're just a tool. But what I wanna do is I want to level the playing field and I want you to understand what patents actually do, their strengths, their weaknesses, their unacceptable expectations that they paint for a small time inventor like yourselves or a backyard inventor like yourselves. Somebody like myself, I was a backyard inventor. I was in the same exact position that you're in. There is a vast difference between inventors on our scale and what a Fortune 1000 company does. Totally different. Same set of rules, same set of laws, but it's a totally different animal. And I want to share with you what you need to know as a very small low-level player that the PTO puts forth and paints a picture that they want to help you and cater to you. But that's really frosting on a cake. It's not the cake itself. It's the system that they're trying to portray, but it's really not. And I'm going to share with you what I know about it. Now, I'm not being negative. I'm being realistic. And this is not a game that you want to be playing and be ignorant of the rules. So that's where we're going in the next several videos, I guess I'm going to be putting up. So today, so let's talk about patent pending. You hear patent pending used all the time. It just means that you filed an application with the USPTO and your application is under consideration. It doesn't really hold any power for you. The only thing it holds for you is your place in line. And your place in line is only going to mean something just like when you go to Walmart, your place in line doesn't mean anything at all until you get to the cash register. Where you get to the cash register, your, your items are accounted for, meaning your claims. 
you pay for your items, you pay for your claims in a sense, you're paying for your, uh, your co-pending grant, and then you check out and you walk out to your car. That is, that is what a patent does. A patent pending has no legal framework for you. So don't get excited when you go on the internet and it says, gee, a provisional patent gives you patent pending status. That's really a paper tiger. That's, that's blue sky. That doesn't mean a damn thing. Your provisional patent application does not get published. It does not get read. And it is a line holder. All it provides for you is a date certain and a priority date that lasts 365 days and it cannot be extended. So now you're at the checkout counter. You have to put the next series of items through the scanner or through the checkout person. And that's going to be your non-provisional. That's the one that's going to have your really well thought out claims, your really thought out specification and your professional drawings. And you're handing this off to another human being that is going to be your judge, your jury, and your trial. And this person, for all intended purposes, is going to be like the high school teacher you had, perhaps, or the college teacher you had, or the graduate school teacher you might have had, that greets the class and says, look, I'm a really hard grader. I don't believe in giving out A's. If you don't like the class, then drop it. Here's what happens. When you hand in a non-provisional patent application to the USPTO, it goes into the hands of an examiner, a man or a woman who's gonna examine your application against all of the prior art that they can pull out of their gigantic database of all the patents that have ever been granted in your particular area that you're filing your patent in. And they are gonna weigh the prior claims, the prior art, the prior citations against your new patent application in that same area. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to provide in your application something that is over the prior art. Your claims must be more beneficial, more utilitarian, and more expedient than the prior art claims. That's what the examiner's main purpose is doing. They are the gatekeepers for new ideas and new inventions where people are seeking to protect them for a 20 year exclusive. So don't get caught up in the fact that you, you filed a provisional and the patent is pending. Certainly don't get caught up in the fact that you filed a non-provisional and the patent is pending. That is really there on the non-provisional with the claims to give constructive notice to other people, other entities, other corporations that are going to play in the same waters as you, or actually you're going to probably be playing in the waters that they control. It gives them what you call constructive notice that you have an idea in the PTO's office and you're waiting to find out if your patent is going to go co-pending, meaning you're going to be getting a grant and it stays co-pending until you pay um, the grant fee. And we'll go into all that as as this uh, series progresses. So let's just say 
I filed a non-provisional patent application for a tangle-free flag. One of the largest flag makers in the United States is Annan. They're located in Northern New Jersey. I forget what town, but their headquarters are there. They've been in business for let's say a century, whatever. The point is I have an application that's gonna end up into the hands of an examiner. And I've been waiting about 18 months for this to happen. It hasn't happened as of this video. If Anna decides to go and make a tangle-free flag using the same technology, using the same specifications, and basically using the same claims as mine, since my patent is in a patent pending status with a non-provisional application, that has a little bit more of a tooth than the milk teeth that you would get with a provisional application. You basically have the teeth of a sparrow in a patent pending situation with your provisional. With a non-provisional, you have a milk tooth of a child. It basically puts Annan on constructive notice should they decide to infringe on this patent application that's in the office, I have an application in and a certain date and I can go back and sue them for damages if I so choose. It gives me a starting point and a recognized stick in the ground that I can go and say, look it, you know that I have a patent application that is pending and we can go back and I can sue you under the constructive notice theory that you're infringing on my non-provisional application. So here's the point. If you're a backyard inventor like I was, a small time company, um, somebody without a lot of means to defend yourself, and you need a lot of means to defend yourself in patent conflicts, and I'm going to be getting into all that in detail. Don't put patent penning on your product at this point. I wouldn't. Try not to let the world know that you even have a patent application out there. Now, this worked great before 2013, before the American Invents Act, where they came up with this brilliant idea to publish your non-provisional patent application after 18 months. But as I pointed out to you, mine was published in about six or seven months time. So they published it a year ahead of time. Try to be as stealthy as possible. The United States Patent Office has destroyed this concept with the first to file and with this American Invents Act and actually showing all the competitors out there in your field what your claims are, what your drawings look like, what your specification is. The people who are best suited to play the patent game are the people that are rich, the people who are wealthy and the major corporations. The people with you and I, like you and I, have to be more guarded, have to stay on the down low, and have to develop several layers of protection of which I'm gonna be sharing with you, which are also gonna be trademarks, trade secrets, inventors, notebooks, documentation, and the like besides your patent if you're to file a patent at all. So the landscape has changed and I just wanna give it to you from my standpoint. I am telling you that I think a very good source for you to understand where I'm coming from. I give you a quick bio about myself in the description below. And I would encourage you to go on my website and read about my background a little deeper. And then you'll know where I'm coming from. I'm not doing these videos so that I can 
go over the same old ground like everybody else. If I didn't think I had something new and unique to throw my hat into the ring, I wouldn't have done this at all. I've taken a long time to think about whether I was going to do this or not. Well over a decade. I know I'm late to the game, but I have something unique to share. It's almost like a set of claims. If I didn't think I had a unique set of claims for this series, I wouldn't be doing it at all. So that's just a taste of what's coming up in the next several videos. We're going to be doing a deep dive on patents and I've bloviated enough. So I'm going to see you in the next video. And as always, take care of yourself and God bless. I'll see you shortly. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.